welcome to the second part of the Stellar Evolution course. So now let us have a look at the interior of a star and how that actually evolves in some more detail. So what we can uh, plot is um, how the structure looks as a function of time inside a star and how these different burning phases and what and the uh, convection, instability, energy generation associated with it uh, evolves as a function of time. And as you may have already gathered, it's a, a very large dynamical range of time scales that play a role. And so what we plot on the x-axis here is the logarithm of the time until core collapse, so until the star, the iron core uh, finally collapses um, in units of years. And um, yeah, the time until it reaches that last phase. Um, and on the y-axis, we plot the enclosed mass, the interior mass. So if you assume the star is roughly spherical, you can draw a sphere and then measure how much mass is sitting inside each of uh, these spheres. So at the very bottom down here, we have the center of the star. And as we go out, we reach here towards the surface of the star. Uh, in this case, it was a 22 solar mass star initially. It was born with 22 solar masses. And then this upper black curve here is the total mass of the star, and that is shrinking uh, because of mass loss from the surface of the star. This mass loss depends on metallicity. So we look here at something that has about solar metallicity, uh, so a current modern uh, present day uh, star. And uh, you may get some impression that this curve sort of uh, because you're steep and then flattens out, uh, but that is also an artifact of the time scale because the time scale is also uh, decreasing significantly. So the, uh, there's less mass loss per unit on our x-axis, but of course the x-axis corresponds to increasingly smaller time. And in practice, if you plotted that as a function of linear time, you would see that the mass loss is not actually decreasing, but increasing. Uh, the star gets more luminous, more expanded, and loses more mass uh, faster. So uh, we have here at the very beginning, on the left-hand side, uh, that's when the star is born, something close to 10 million years before its death. Then we have here 1 million years before it dies at 6. Then here in the middle at uh, uh, zero labeling at the x-axis, it's one year before the star dies. And then down here, uh, we have at uh, about 7.5, minus 7.5. Uh, we have one second before the star dies. And here the diagram ends here at about a quarter of a second before the uh, core uh, bounds. So the collapse of the star reaches its first uh, very dense point. So it's a very highly, uh, very large dynamical uh, scale of a more than 14 orders of magnitude, 15 orders of magnitude in time scale that we are covering here. Okay. Uh, so uh, now let's fill this. Uh, let's first, let's plot uh, nuclear energy generation. And so this is here in blue shading. Uh, you have a scale up here. So each uh, shade of blue is one order of magnitude higher specific nuclear energy generation. So energy release uh, in ERGs per gram in second uh, of the mass. And uh, we do that because we also plot here mass coordinate on the y-axis. So it gives you a good representation, color times area is the total amount of energy produced in there. But each level of sh uh, uh, shading is an order of magnitude decrease in energy generation rate, specific energy generation rate um, going outward. So the first one here is uh, 0.1 ergs per gram in second, and it goes here to 10 to 5 ergs per gram in second. So this is uh, what these blue levels uh, of shading are. Then we can also add in uh, purple is uh, energy losses, and these are energy losses are mostly due to neutrinos. Uh, but what I actually plot in this figure is uh, energy production from nuclear burning minus neutrino losses. So there's large parts where the neutrino losses dominated, and then there's some small parts here that we have seen here. And we come back uh, to what these are. Um, these are uh, uh, where nuclear burning dominates in these regions. Otherwise, we had to, would have to plot them on top of each other, which doesn't work. So, so this is uh, either the, the net, the sum of neutrino 
energy losses and nuclear production is plotted as a shading. And when it's negative, it's in these uh, um, purple shades. And again, the same uh, kind of scale where, we, where each shade of purple is one order of, of magnitude more specific nuclear energy loss. And you, you, uh, you may recall, for example, hydrogen burning. Yes, you have both at the same time. You have the nuclear burning and then some fraction of that energy was carried away in form of neutrinos from the weak processes, but the net was still positive. And uh, then another very important ingredient is um, convection. So these are regions where you have uh, turnover from hydrodynamic instabilities. This is sort of similar to when you put a, a pot with a noodle soup on your stove and you heat it from the bottom and then you see this convective uh, turnovers. And these convective turnovers are uh, very important. Uh, so uh, for the star at first, it's a mode of energy transport, uh, similar to your pot. You heat it at the very bottom and the uh, uh, gas or liquid in your pot at the bottom gets hot, it expands, it has a uh, lower density and therefore rises. And the same thing is happening in the star as well. You have uh, energy input at the bottom uh, because the nuclear burning is concentrated to the bottom. It releases a lot of energy. Uh, the gas expands and bubbles uh, uh, rise and uh, mix uh, that area. So they transport the energy, same way that the heat from the bottom of your uh, boiling pot reaches the surface where you have the vapor coming off. And, but at the same time, if you have noodles in your soup, you will uh, see that the noodles are no longer just sitting at the bottom or at the top. Uh, they are mixed uh, throughout. And the same thing happens to, here as well in a star in convective regions is that the convection does not only contribute to the energy transport, but another key uh, property of it is that it keeps that the region, the convective region uh, reasonably well, chemical homogeneous, reasonably well mixed uh, so it has more or less constant uh, composition throughout. And we'll come back to that uh, in two or three slides. So that's uh, two uh, effects uh, that comes from the convection. There's another process uh, called semi-convection, the similar convection, but it's, uh, um, well, it's not, not quite similar. This convection is suppressed by composition gradients in these regions. So there's still some transport, mostly of heat going on um, but uh, the, uh, yeah, the process is much lower and there's not as much composition transport. So these regions are therefore not generally chemically homogeneous. There's some mixing happening across, but by far not as efficient as uh, convection. Yeah, up here you see this uh, very big green region. So this, it turns out these are just a couple of very small uh, convective region next to each other. And I draw a frame around each of these convective regions so you can see the boundary exactly. Like for example, here see an interface between two shells down here that you would not be able to see if there was not no boundary drawn. But here's just so many boundaries as the entire region appears green. But in reality, it's uh, just many small zones uh, next to each other uh, that live in that regime. They act sort of similar to semi-convection. They intersperse with semi-convection and are tightly uh, related to that. So, so some modest mixing going on in this region, but not the same as, as here where you have uh, complete convective regions without any uh, boundaries to neighboring regions. So you have the full convection throughout. Okay, so uh, now uh, what are these different parts uh, that we are seeing here? Uh, so here again, my full legend up here. And uh, so the first phase that we see is uh, hydrogen burning and the hydrogen is burning convectively uh, in this star by the CNO cycle. It um, releases a lot of energy, drives this convection um, and uh, it also depletes hydrogen in this entire region more or less at the same time. So when you reach the end of hydrogen burning, the entire convective region, which is more or less chemical homogeneous is depleted in hydrogen at the same time. And then hydrogen starts continuing in a shell. And out here we have, so there's a convective core and we have a radiative uh, envelope. So the star is still becomes a kind of blue chine uh, in this case. Uh, and so there, yeah, the hydrogen burns here the shell and goes out and outside of that shell that becomes very thin, they're sitting a huge convective region, a convective envelope. And so 
in these later burning stages after core hydrogen burning, the star becomes uh, more or less a red supergiant star. But in inferior evolution still continues onward. So after hydrogen burning, the next phase we have is core helium burning. And similar to the hydrogen burning, it is convective. You remember you first convert helium to carbon, then carbon to oxygen for the most part. Uh, but eventually the helium is gone. And when it's gone, it's also completed more or less uh, in the entire region at the same time. And then it continues burning in some shell outside. It even becomes here uh, convective again. Then the next phase of uh, evolution is uh, core carbon burning. In this case, it is not convective for a star as massive as 20 solar masses. Um, a reason is that uh, also is that the helium burning does not leave uh, a large fraction of carbon uh, behind. You remember we have seen that more massive stars will generally produce less carbon at the end and more oxygen. And so this low carbon abundance we have here, initially it just melts away, uh, burning in a radiative shell, but eventually the energy generation gets uh, fast enough and energetic enough uh, to drive a convective shell. Uh, then you have another carbon burning shell out here um, until we reach the end. And so, uh, so here we see that's here of the order, in this case, 300 years for that star when it first starts, then goes uh, very far down, only a few 10 years for the shell carbon burning. And then here, this is only basically one year for this final burning uh, stage of carbon shell burning. And then you have down here neon burning. In this case, there's a very short, very flashy one neon burning shell and, uh, and two, three, a couple of others. And then later we see some more neon burning shells. So these are usually very uh, short here. It lives at uh, one year before the star's death. You, have, you, have, you can may have several of them. Um, and that is followed with the, by the more extended uh, oxygen burning. We have the oxygen burning core and then oxygen burning shell, another oxygen burning shell, and also some final oxygen burning shell that reaches uh, to the stars, uh, to the end of the star's life. And then we have here, uh, finally, silicon burning. Um, as I said, it's, uh, um, yeah, uh, in this case, very short. Uh, it's of the order of, uh, well, one hundredth of a year. So that's half a week, maybe a little bit more uh, than that, uh, four or five days. So uh, silicon burning in the core and then silicon burning a shell. And then eventually you reach uh, the end of the evolution. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, the star would then contract and collapse. You build an iron core and the iron core collapses and it undergoes uh, some uh, yeah, transitions. It captures lots of electrons and uh, it starts photo disintegrating the heavy nuclei that you build here by burning from silicon burning back into lighter nuclei. And all of this costs a lot of energy. It makes the core even more unstable and then it uh, collapses towards a neutron star and eventually uh, or possibly a black hole depending on the size of the iron core. In this case, probably not quite a, a supernova, a black hole. Uh, well, but we'll have to see. Depends on many details of the structure of that star. Uh, so that's a very uh, simplified 1D uh, version uh, of what is going on where you have these nice uh, sharp boundaries. But in practice, uh, when you did this in hydrodynamic simulation or look at real stars, like the surface of the sun, there's all of these granules. So there's lots of things going on when you have convection. And so generally you may have some boundary layer between convective region that is uh, more or less uh, turbulent. And these turbulent waves, they can drive some uh, internal or gravity, it's called gravity waves. It's different from gravitational waves, as gravity waves. Uh, there can also be in general some rotation of the stars so there can be some shear flow or even large scale convective cells could drive some shear flow at the interface between here this convective region and this radiative non-convective region outside. And you may have some density uh, stratification uh, that you have, may maybe have heavier material down here from nuclear burning and lighter material outside that has not yet uh, been burned. So it's a very complicated structure um, in reality. And there's uh, various uncertainties associated with this picture, namely how fast uh, do you really, or how much do you really mix outside of that convective region uh, beyond uh, what you would uh, estimate from uh, simple arguments. 
And people have started doing some multidimensional simulations. Up here is a row of a few attempts in two-dimensional simulation. We start first like in the 1D picture that we have been looking at, have some convective core and some radiative outer region. But then once the convection starts going, at least in these uh, simulations that had um, yeah, a certain specific setup that was not uh, self-consistent with the actual simulation of the transport as it appears. Um, um, these bubbles seem to be uh, overflowing this standard convective uh, region. And uh, down here is some simulations done in 3D. They have convection happening in, in, this, in this region down here, but it starts having sound waves uh, that travel outside. So it's not associated with composition. It's just, uh, just uh, motion. So sound waves that are excited by this motion inside the convective regions, things are bubbling up. Uh, and having uh, turnovers and flows, and every now and then it, yeah, it, it can ignite the sound waves. They may uh, mostly, like real waves on an ocean, it mostly moves things up and down, and you don't build up a layer of mixed hydrogen, uh, um, uh, water, and air on top of the ocean, but the waves just go up and down, and something similar may here. But every now and then there may also be some mixing from penetration from this. So it's um, a complicated process to fully understand and simulate on the correctly resolved uh, scales. Uh, so, so much for uh, the, this uh, simple picture of convective boundaries that I drew with my nice uh, green lines. So something much more complicated may actually be happening there. Um, so we already looked at this diagram of central density and central temperature uh, for 15 and 25 solar mass star at the opening slide. So how is the fates of other stars in uh, relation? So once your, st your stellar mass gets uh, somewhat below 10 solar masses, we'll see more about this later, uh, the, the stars follow a kind of similar path. Of course, it's not just straight, they'll have some wiggles in there for real stars. So that's a very schematic uh, region. Um, uh, the star may encounter electron degeneracy. That's a property of the equation of state. And we can't go into details uh, here. So basically, the pressure is supplied by the degenerate gas, even when the temperature drops a, uh, a lot. Uh, and therefore, yeah, you can't uh, continue compressing the star and get energy out from uh, compression or it need ignite further burning phases. So the uh, um, star uh, might follow a path uh, where it just uh, gets somewhat denser until eventually you uh, might have in the center some uh, electron capture uh, happening and driving a sort of supernova that it collapses if the uh, density gets high enough, you go uh, get um, close to the critical mass. So something that's close to the central Sega mass. And then you have collapse and possibly you can get explosion or just uh, most of the, the uh, core collapsing to a neutron star. Uh, so for a 15 solar mass star, the evolution goes all the way up here to very high uh, densities and temperatures, as you have already seen, and you might make a core collapse supernovae. So the iron core collapses and uh, the neutrinos that are come out drive a supernova explosion. If you go to more massive stars, uh, then uh, you uh, might uh, encounter here an instability of photodisintegration in the core on the mass path. But the, the object is already so big that it might not no longer be able to drive a explosion and instead you might make a black hole. And then if you go up to higher masses, there's other things that can happen. Uh, for a few hundred solar masses, you encounter something called the pair instability supernovae, where again it's an equation of state instability uh, that then leads to collapse. And for the most massive stars up here, uh, you, uh, um, you again go more or less directly. Uh, to collapse and might be making a black hole. Also, we will discuss uh, you know, what happens across that region. Okay, so once we are up here towards uh, the supernova, uh, we might um, yeah, get a uh, core collapse supernova. Let's have a quick look at that. I have my little artist's impression of a supernova. So a very big explosion. And uh, what happens in the interior, this comes from um, a simulation from Bernhard Müller and visualization. Uh, you have some bubbles of 
uh, high entropy material that drive a shock uh, that eventually can uh, give you an explosion of the star. And depending on the detailed properties, uh, these explosions can also be fairly asymmetric at first. Uh, so the supernovae are not necessarily all the same, nicely spherical, but as usually we expect to be uh, vast uh, asymmetries in the supernova explosions, at least in the interior part. In the outer part, it may be, uh, appear then uh, more spherical. Uh, observationally, um, one can try to identify uh, what stars actually explode. And this is some pioneering work done by Stephen Smart, uh, where they uh, took pictures of galaxies. And then when a supernova goes off, uh, they uh, look where exactly uh, that is, and then go back in their uh, old images to identify, find uh, the, the star that has actually exploded. And from its luminosity and other properties, temperature, uh, they try to estimate the mass of the star. And this is, shows you just um, sorted all of these uh, different supernovae by the mass of the star. And um, you may have heard when you have star formation, usually one assumes there's a kind of power law for how many stars you make of which mass, where the more massive stars get increasingly less uh, likely to be made. And one can compare with such a distribution uh, these derived masses of the stars that made the supernova. And uh, so there's uh, two um, the, uh, curves here. One, uh, the solid curve is if only stars up to 6.5 times the mass of the sun would explode, uh, then you would uh, expect this one distribution. So you have here some measurements with bars in both directions and also some upper limits. Uh, but of course, the upper limits have also some errors associated with them. Uh, so uh, for comparison, uh, they also draw here a curve uh, where, which assumes that you make stars up to about uh, 35 solar masses to explode a supernovae and only those above that make uh, black holes. And then you get this uh, dash curve. And it's uh, still sort of consistent for many of these stars of uh, initial mass, but it gets problematic for the higher masses where it may be uh, too many. So uh, from that observationally, we would only say, well, somewhere between 16, 17 and 30 solar masses is probably some uh, kind of cutoff between stars exploding and uh, stars instead uh, making black holes. And there's another similar work uh, by Williams where uh, they do a match and uh, some of their best matches is maybe uh, a cutoff for stars still exploding a supernovae around maybe 20 solar masses. Um, but of course, uh, that's a kind of a single uh, idea picture. Um, but what you may have instead uh, could also be that you actually have above somewhere around 20 solar masses, some bifurcation. So sometimes uh, we see uh, stars that appear to be uh, very bright. This is explosion energy, kinetic energy of the ejector as a function of uh, initial mass of the star on the x-axis. Um, and so typical supernova energy is somewhere around here. Kinetic energy of the ejector is of the order of 10 to 51 erg. And uh, the idea uh, of Kenomotus was that yeah, well, we maybe have a branch up here of very powerful explosions that could be uh, stars that are powered in a certain way, say by black holes. So you have a black hole and have an accretion disk around it and gives you a large energy source that possibly drive extremely powerful explosions. Um, some of them may have been associated with gamma ray bursts that we have seen, uh, so some uh, jet driven uh, explosion uh, from an accretion disk around a black hole. And, but there were also others, other supernovae uh, that had uh, apparently very high kinetic energy of their ejector. And of course, these are bright, uh, bright explosions. So you see them far out in the universe, whereas there may also be a faint branch where you don't get an explosion and the star just collapses to a black hole. Uh, and those, uh, because they are faint, you wouldn't see them uh, to large distances. Um, so that's uh, already interesting. Um, 
um, one can actually look at the entire variety of things uh, of explosions and transients that um, are out there. And I have here a slide that is uh, definitely uh, very dense. And it shows here on the x-axis the characteristic time scale of some kind of transients. So in astronomy, we call transients um, uh, objects we see in the sky that only shine for a limited amount of time. So they are there for a yeah, small transient uh, time, they appear for a brief time and then disappear again. Uh, so a typical uh, example of course supernovae. So we have a core collapse supernova, thermonuclear supernovae, it's a different kind exploding white dwarfs. Um, but there could be uh, all uh, other kinds of uh, supernovae. Um, and then there's, uh, this is the main life curve of the supernovae of the order of tens of days, weeks to month. Uh, but initially, when the supernova explodes as a shock that hits the surface first, and that would uh, give also some initial uh, precursor life curve uh, that is can be bright and uh, although blue air, uh, but it's rather short in time. So it's uh, only of the order of uh, hours um, or even shorter for a type 1a supernovae. And then there's a whole variety of other kinds of events uh, like uh, gamma ray first afterglow. So this is after um, probably a massive star um, collapses and makes a gamma ray burst. There could be an afterglow uh, from this or, uh, yeah. And then we see other kinds of uh, transients of various kinds. So there's these normal supernovae, but every now and then there's also this very special case here, uh, superluminous supernovae. These are kind of supernovae, but they are just much brighter by, well, you can see here the scale by a factor 100 to maybe even 1,000 than a normal supernovae. And the reason how they can do that is uh, one of the ways of accomplishing that is uh, that we've seen on the previous slide, uh, the kinetic energy of the ejector. But for normal supernovae, uh, what you actually observe is the, uh, or directly observe is the energy that comes out in photons. And that turns out to be normally 100 times less than the kinetic energy of the supernova. But when, if, uh, one of uh, or the ejector with all of this kinetic energy run into something in the surrounding, uh, then so, uh, some of this kinetic energy could be uh, heating up gas by collision with other gas. And that uh, gives you a bubble of hot gas, uh, with, which can be extremely uh, luminous. So you one can see some extra luminosity if some of this kinetic energy that is actually supernovae is uh, thermalized. So they uh, can become uh, more uh, bright. And there's a couple of many other things uh, that can happen here, but it's beyond the scope of this talk. I just show it to give you some uh, overview of what might all happen, uh, what, what you might be all observing, and other things that can be interesting in, in terms of astrophysics uh, to look at. Some of these things also being uh, related to uh, nuclear astrophysics, like uh, NOVI uh, down here, or X ray binary stars. I have accretion onto compact objects, um, all kinds of interesting uh, phenomena that might be there. Let me quickly talk about energy sources uh, for uh, supernovae. So the, uh, the very basic idea, how can we actually power uh, supernovae and uh, to tell us about the fate of massive stars in general. Um, so there is uh, the first possible source, not typical for massive stars, well, not for all of them, uh, is uh, thermonuclear energy. Uh, so prominently there's a type 1a supernovae. This would be exploding white dwarfs. So uh, they don't explode by themselves, but by interacting with a companion star from which they accrete mass or uh, they merge. Um, so that's here on the mass scale. This would be of the order of one, two, three solar masses. So when they come together. Um, and then uh, there is other regimes yeah, for massive stars. There can be pulsational or full pair instability supernovae. I will come back to these uh, at a mass scale of around 100 solar masses. And then there is uh, possibly um, some stars exploding uh, even on the time scale uh, on the mass scale of 100,000 solar masses, depending on the metallicity um, of these uh, stars. But there might be 
uh, explosions for these big objects if you were actually ever able to make such objects. Definitely, it would be extremely rare if any of them uh, ever existed at all. So then a much more um, down to earth uh, way of exploding stars is uh, by the iron core collapse is collapsing and making a neutron star and uh, that neutron star would uh, then uh, emit neutrinos and um, these neutrinos interact with the surrounding matter, deposit energy there and drive an explosion. Uh, so that's uh, the, the standard paradigm for a normal sort of garden variety core collapse uh, supernovae. And uh, they would uh, operate on a range of uh, somewhere maybe uh, tens of masses slightly below to uh, a few tens of solar masses. Um, we don't know exactly uh, how far they can go out. We will, so we will talk about this in a little bit. Uh, then there's another way that neutron stars might be able to give you an explosion, namely if your star was rapidly enough rotating and uh, so you, and is highly magnetized, uh, then you make a uh, rotating uh, magnetic dipole inside your star that, uh, from that neutron star. Um, so similar to this phenomenon of a magnetar and that can deposit a lot of energy um, inside the, uh, so, uh, in the surroundings of the neutron star. That is a significant energy source from that, the rotational energy of the neutron star can be a um, noticeable fraction, a few uh, percent, tens, uh, tens percent of the um, binding energy of uh, that neutron star. And the neutron star energy is uh, of the order of 100 times larger uh, than the kinetic energy of most of these explosions. So that's also the reason why the neutrinos that are usually very futile, but some of them interact in the hot gas surrounding the proto-neutron star uh, and you need to tap only 1% or a few percent of these neutrino energies to drive the explosion. But here you have now an energy source uh, that is much more efficient in, in uh, taking out uh, some part of that gravitational energy coming from the uh, collapse towards a neutron star that uh, angular momentum conservation has forced to go into rotational energy of the neutron star. And that, that can be tapped if there's a strong magnetic field, you make a magnetar model, then give you can some powerful uh, explosion. If there was still some accretion going on, then eventually and such an object might still uh, collapse to a black hole, but at least initially it could also drive uh, some explosion. And then uh, for the higher masses of stars, uh, we might expect uh, that uh, the neutrino mechanism no longer works and we have instead uh, or the magnetar um, also fails if your central object is getting uh, above the mass limit for neutron stars uh, and in that case the core of the star will collapse to a black hole but if there's enough rotation um, you, uh, the material would not be able to fall directly in the black hole but would have would be forced into a accretion disk around the black hole first and such an accretion disk can be extremely efficient at extracting rest mass of matter in, uh, in um, uh, terms of energy up to 42.3% um, or so may be extracted if the material falls in and the, and the black hole is already spinning very uh, rapidly. And that kind of uh, collapse and uh, process and the process of making an explosion might work over a large range of masses. So just because I'm saying here, okay, there's a collapse or a black hole model that gives you an explosion doesn't mean that all of these massive stars actually explode and um, actually uh, give you uh, yeah, a, a explosion. So most of these, if there's not enough rotation, uh, they may just uh, collapse to a black hole and the star disappears. But uh, if there's enough rotation, and you can force the material into some accretion disk around the black hole, then you might be able to drive uh, one of these powerful explosions called a, a collapse model. So we have an accretion disk around the black hole, extracting potential energy of the material spiraling in 
onto uh, the central black hole. So that's uh, the, the basic picture of what might all drive our, uh, or the final explosion of our massive uh, stars. So um, let's have a look at, uh, another look at how the fates of stars actually look like as a function of initial mass. We have already some idea about that, uh, but let's have another look uh, in terms of the remnants and um, everything that uh, comes out. So what I plot here is the initial mass of the star, again, on a logarithmic scale on the x-axis, and then the final mass of remnants uh, or uh, of the star at, uh, at the time when it collapses or loses its fast last uh, pieces of mass uh, before it's forming a remnant. So if there was no mass loss at all, everything that comes in goes out, uh, we would have here this uh, dotted line. So there's a line of x equal, uh, x equal y, but it's a little bit offset here on the y-axis relative to the x-axis. So just shift up uh, by uh, factor uh, three. So you can see here three feet, but it's a diagonal running through here, 10, 10. Um, okay. Uh, so that's uh, what we would have. Um, but uh, uh, then you can distinguish different regimes with something we call low mass stars. So stars are uh, below eight solar masses. And so this would be stars that don't directly make core collapse supernovae. And then there's here this domain of massive stars that reaches up to, um, uh, here in this figure, it's 100 solar masses, but it may be uh, only 80 solar masses where you just have a normal core collapse uh, supernovae. And then stars that are more massive than that, uh, maybe more than 100 solar masses, we would call very massive stars. But this, uh, this nomenclature um, is somewhat fluent. This is just my favorite nomenclature calling stars from say 100, uh, from 10 to 100 solar masses, massive stars, and those beyond uh, very massive stars. And those below uh, the cutoff where you start making super, uh, core collapse supernovae, I would call low mass stars. But if someone working in this regime of stars below 10 solar masses, for them, uh, low mass stars may be stars that are much less massive than uh, three solar masses. And they would call these already high or intermediate mass stars up here, which uh, for, for someone working on massive stars is low mass stars. So I tr trust that you are, uh, be aware when you hear these classifications of low mass stars and high mass stars, what kind of literature uh, you are reading and then check what the actual numbers are with, uh, without making. Uh, assumptions because they may vary. Okay, uh, so at the low mass end, uh, we have, uh, we run through uh, hydrogen helium burning and the end of helium burning, uh, we still have not lost a lot of mass. And uh, so almost all of the, or the majority of the mass has been retained. And uh, what these stars will be making at the lowest end, they make carbon oxygen white dwarfs. So you only run through hydrogen and helium burning. And then uh, the stars eject the outer layers in the so-called asymptotic giant branch mass loss. So that's where thermonuclear pulses that happen in the, uh, in, in the outer helium and hydrogen shells that throw out the outer layers. And you may have heard about this so far uh, already. Uh, and uh, then uh, at some higher masses, you, you can actually ignite carbon burning and burn some of it to uh, neon magnesium oxygen. And then you have here neon magnesium oxygen white dwarfs as remnants. So the outer layers, again, will be uh, puffed off by this asymptotic giant branch uh, pulses and mass loss. So once we get uh, beyond uh, that uh, threshold where we even can ignite uh, neon burning, uh, the remaining burning phases, so oxygen burning is usually almost guaranteed and it runs through as well oxygen silicon burning and you start building up your iron core that collapses to make a neutron star. Uh, so at, at the same uh, time, when you go to more massive stars, uh, the mass loss at the surface from stellar winds will become more important. So these stars are now red super giant stars, uh, not asymptotic giant branch stars, uh, uh, but they, will still they may still have strong winds from the surfaces because they are uh, fairly bright and they can blow off significant parts of the outer layers. And uh, in the interior, 
uh, we, we now start making neutron stars, maybe uh, low mass neutron stars at the beginning when just the iron core is still very small. Uh, and then you make uh, more massive neutron stars and eventually the neutron star mass increases to a point where uh, uh, you uh, yeah, are beyond the mass limit for the most massive uh, neutron stars. And uh, uh, yeah, you can only make uh, black holes from this point on. Okay. Uh, we also see here uh, indicated what the helium core uh, actually looked like. So this is the core where, the, where our hydrogen has has converted hydrogen to, he to helium, and then uh, what we call here the CO core. So that's a region where we also have um, all the helium being burned uh, to carbon oxygen. Um, and then you have a quark collapse supernova. You would expect that all of this outer part here uh, be ejected. Uh, but if we go beyond uh, this point, uh, uh, then something uh, different may happen. Um, uh, namely, uh, that uh, material is uh, falling back onto the central core. So you don't have enough energy anymore to eject uh, all of the mass of the increasingly larger envelope surrounding your star. And uh, then the material is uh, falling back into the center. So if it's not pushed out, and if you get beyond the maximum mass of the neutron star, uh, then uh, yeah, you have a black hole formation uh, from fallback. And that is, um, and it's, it's mostly the inner parts of the star. So all of these uh, elements that you have synthesized, what astronomers call metals, uh, would fall back all the carbon, oxygen, and so forth. So that's also what most of this here stuff, uh, what's falling into this black hole here is made of the elements necessary to life, carbon, oxygen, uh, that uh, everything in here is silicon, sulfur, you might see here, that everything in here is made of is falling back onto the central black hole and is therefore not escaping from uh, your supernova. Okay, uh, so uh, the Generic idea is that you uh, exceed the maximum mass of neutron star because you were not able to push all of the material out to infinity from the finite amount of energy that your supernova releases. And you uh, start making a black hole by uh, fallback. And there's also here this interesting regime where the mass loss uh, actually uh, comes down and uh, and uh, you have lost and your entire hydrogen envelope and you and the additional mass loss is starting to eat into your star from the helium core and uh, what that means is that you have a different spectral type at the surface a different kind of star and these kind of these stars would be called wolf riot stars especially the early type of wolf riot stars where you are uh, entirely hydrogen free and as your wind may eat in, uh, into the star even further, you may reach a regime that is very rich in carbon. And eventually, if it reaches deep enough in your core, you remember for these massive stars, we made, made mostly oxygen. It may even uncover layers uh, that are rich in oxygen. And you have then different subclasses of stars, W and E wolf riot stars, nitrogen rich of the early kind, and what up, carbon rich wolf riot stars, or uh, oxygen rich world five stars. So generally these, these hydrogen free stars would tend to have very strong, hydrogen free massive stars have very strong winds and they appear as what is called world wide stars that are stars that have winds that are so massive, so dense uh, that they actually uh, are not uh, transparent and you can, you can no longer see the surface of the star. So a special uh, yeah, spectral type, a special kind of star that has such strong winds. Um, then I show up here some things that are called uh, luminous blue variable stars and uh, another phase of uh, wolf right phase when you still have some hydrogen left called WNL uh, for late type stars that they, these um, kinds of stellar evolution phases can also uh, 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 add to the um, reduction of the mass of the star uh, before its death. 
So these are important. There's lots of things that can happen in these massive stars when they get when they start losing their outer surface layers, and um, you can see deeper in, uh, inside or, or um, uncover material that was uh, made in the burning inside the star directly. Uh, and then, uh, but it's very uncertain where exactly we are here, so that's why it's uh, dashed. And accordingly, uh, you may make remnants that are just uh, somewhat less massive than the mass of the star uh, at the time it collapses. Maybe some of its outer layers uh, can escape. Um, but probably in, in many of these cases, most of the material uh, may be falling back. And this is uh, also where the ejected metals, so everything that's heavier than hydrogen helium uh, would be made. So it is uh, either coming out uh, here, it's synthesized uh, in the star, and then the supernova shock releases this. But when it does so, it does some extra uh, nuclear burning in here, shock heating of the gas, um, and uh, doing some explosive nuclear synthesis in these, these outer layers. Um, and here uh, in this upper end, uh, lots of these uh, metals, these heavy material can be blown off the surface from stellar wind. So even without a, an explosion, uh, you uh, can already eject some uh, metals uh, from, uh, from the star. So one thing that's also mark, uh, um, yeah, important and you should remember, so this uh, uh, object that we made here, uh, this, the iron core that we made from, from uh, burning phases up to silicon burning uh, to iron, most of this disappears in a neutron star in the black hole. And the iron that we find in the universe instead is being made by the shock of the supernova running through these inner layers here. And that's superheating the material, shock burning it, or even first photo disintegrating it into alpha particles that then recombine into uh, nickel 56 uh, that powers the light curves and later also decays uh, to iron, which is why there's uh, so much iron 56 because of the way it is uh, being made in these supernova explosions. So this is one way where the metals come out and the other way uh, for, for massive stars, you may blow off some of them, uh, but these stars would typically be uh, very rare um, in the first place because of the uh, initial mass function uh, has much few, uh, makes much fewer of the massive stars than it makes of lighter stars. So that is uh, the cartoon picture of what we expect. So we have uh, down here live white dwarfs, we have neutron stars, and then we have black holes, and there's some kind of dividing line between uh, these different domains. Um, so that's uh, yeah, the simple uh, back of the envelope uh, picture, but the real picture looks uh, somewhat more complicated. And so uh, what is shown here is uh, the different core masses um, that you have at the end of evolution as a function of initial mass. And this is a combination of some 2000 stellar, stellar models that were computed with a mass resolution of 0.01 solar masses in between. Uh, there's a little bit of numerical jitter on top of that. Um, and uh, some of these things come from uh, the skip, skips that you see here in the, in the red colors uh, come from how the criteria is uh, being applied. Uh, so the total mass of the star, well, uh, this is the black, which is not actually visible. It's outside of this figure, but then we can see the next uh, is the helium core of the star as a function of initial mass. And uh, that is uh, increasing. And then we have the carbon oxygen core uh, so where uh, the helium has burned, that's also a reasonably uh, smooth curve. But then when you look in these later evolution stages, we see uh, uh, something first gradually uh, growing and then suddenly uh, chopping, uh, well, jumping in their uh, values for the silicon, uh, neon, um, and iron core masses. So there's some real discontinuities in the evolution. Um, between uh, the stars as a function of initial mass. And for example, here there's even some, some very noted, uh, notable uh, bumps in the sizes of say the oxygen uh, shell or the uh, iron core uh, that you have in these stars. And the reason is uh, 
these different uh, shells that you remember from our Kippenhahn diagrams, uh, these green hatching regions, um, that uh, you have seen there was a discrete number of these. And whenever you have discrete things, uh, that's a very uh, highly nonlinear um, yeah, behavior if uh, something uh, yeah, can change discontinuously. Uh, or you have discrete shells because it's difficult integer number. You have one shell or two shell or three shells, but it is, uh, between one and two, it's not continuous in, in terms of uh, real uh, numbers. And what really happens there is that you have this interaction of the shells. So sometimes it is required to have a minimum mass of a core, say a minimum mass of an oxygen core before it can actually ignite oxygen. But if the preceding neon or carbon burning shell uh, produced an oxygen core that was uh, slightly below the threshold that you need to actually ignite carbon, then you will instead have, sorry, ignite oxygen. You would, for example, have instead another uh, carbon burning shell going off and that uh, sitting now on uh, very close on top of that oxygen shell, uh, which is already very dense. And so there will be a large potential at the bottom of that carbon burning shell and it makes a very huge carbon burning shell. And then you add up with a, a much larger oxygen core um, after that carbon shell has uh, finished. Then uh, the opposite, if, you, if your initial uh, oxygen core was just above, slightly above the threshold, you would not have that carbon shell, uh, this additional carbon shell, and you would just uh, directly uh, collapse. And this is the, where the origin of these kind of discontinuities. And we have not only just uh, one of these uh, burning phases like oxygen burning, but we have several different uh, of these burning phases and they all interact uh, with each other. And that gives you many of these discontinuous behaviors. And there's even here some region where it seems almost entirely uh, chaotic around 18 solar masses. And uh, that is caused by a transition when the carbon burning becomes from uh, initially uh, being convective to starting uh, behaving, uh, you know, burning radiatively, as we have seen in this example of a Kittenham diagram of 22 solar masses where the carbon burning actually started igniting uh, in, in, uh, in a shell. And sometimes in this transition between burning in a, sorry, ignited in a radiative shell uh, that burned uh, outward. And so sometimes when you have, uh, uh, or, or at this transition, you would expect, you will actually find lots of very small carbon shells. And so that causes then this uh, kind of chaos. There's lots of uh, changes coming in here, seeded by this transition from uh, convective core carbon burning to radiative core carbon burning in the cell or initial burning in the center. And then you have some humps, so there's some structure uh, that we see. So here's another example of uh, a discontinuity or sensitivity of the structure to initial masses. So what can, for example, also happen is that in one case, uh, you have here a, a shell that says, separated for some time. In another case, that was here just slightly more massive, so from 20.1 to 20.2 solar masses, uh, you suddenly had these shells merging together here at minus uh, 2.5, so these outer carbon burning shells here. And then in, instead of having these separated shells that you see in the upper panel, you would have some very extended uh, shell that uh, covers the entire regime. And what this implies is that material from the top can be transported all the way down uh, to the bottom. And that changes how uh, the, uh, the, the structure of the star looks like because the material being attracted down uh, produces extra energy and that expands the star more. And so the entire structure uh, will be impacted by this. Uh, so there's uh, consequences of these uh, variations in structure uh, are also reflected in the remnant masses uh, that you make uh, from these stars. And so here we show as a function of initial mass, um, a uh, yeah, parameter called compactness parameter, basically telling you how easy it is to explode stars. So the, the higher this compactness parameter is basically the mass uh, divided uh, by 
the radius of the masses corresponds to, in this case, 2.5 solar masses. Uh, and, they, uh, in, in, and then you divide the radius in uh, units of 1,000 kilometers, and it gives you some uh, value theta m. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we see here uh, different regimes. One of the regimes is explosion. Um, so the, the, the theta parameter itself, uh, it's uh, curious, but what's really more important about this figure is the colors uh, in it as a function of mass on the x-axis. And uh, we see that you have actually here some regions of explosion, maybe even at low uh, solar masses. Uh, our uh, estimate that we made here uh, would indicate that you might get uh, occasionally a black hole even at low masses. Uh, and then definitely beyond 20 to 23 or so, there's a big bump in compactness where you most likely uh, are starting to make black holes. Uh, but then there can also be a window uh, somewhere around, in our case, 23 to 25 solar masses, 26, um, where stars might explode again. So we sometimes call this the window of explodability. And uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. So it's not just a, uh, the, uh, the, the key lesson is there's not just, uh, or there may not be just a simple uh, dividing line where you can say everything above that is exploding uh, or below that is exploding and everything above that is making black holes. Uh, it is much more complicated and it's because of the structure in the star, because of these different burning shells that interact and set the structure in a specific way that can vary in the nonlinear a way as you increase uh, the mass of your stars. Um, this plot here ends around uh, 30 something uh, solar masses. Um, what uh, it can be somewhat interesting is also what happens at higher masses or uh, the high mass end that was kind of dashed in our previous uh, figure because we don't really know uh, uh, very well what is happening, largely also because these very massive stars uh, often they are very hard to measure and they are very, very rare and uh, very rarely born. And on top of that, they're even very short lived. They live only of the order of 2 million years. And so it's uh, harder uh, to be lucky enough to observe one of them. Um, here, this is a, a, picture, a picture of what might be uh, the most massive star in our galaxy or certainly one of them. Uh, that star uh, A1 in this cluster R136. Um, and we think uh, the age of that star or this cluster is around 1.5 million years. And that star A1 may be as massive as 200 solar masses, at least initially when it was born. Uh, but there is some observational uncertainties because uh, it could be a binary star and uh, two stars of 100 solar masses each will actually look extremely similar to one star of 200 solar masses. And so uh, there's a, also a question of resolution, uh, whether we can uh, easily uh, tell that. Uh, but if you have stars uh, that are uh, massive enough, uh, then they can undergo a, a very uh, special behavior and uh, so that's called pulsational pair instability. So these are masses uh, that if they don't lose uh, their mass before that from stellar winds, so this is, for example, stars of very low metallicity, stars that live very early in the universe, uh, they will have much weaker winds because winds are usually driven by spectral lines of complex uh, elements. And uh, initially in the early universe, there was only hydrogen, helium, and there's much less spectral lines that can drive winds, so there may be much less mass loss. But even if the star has reached its head with its end without losing a lot of mass, uh, there is uh, this instability that can set in in the center. Uh, we have uh, seen that in uh, one of the earlier slides, um, where basically uh, you reach a domain where the temperature and density is such that you can make electron positron pairs. And these electron positron pairs, therefore, while you take energy from the radiation field and convert it into rest mass, so you lose a lot of energy this way, and that also loses pressure support. The star starts contracting for some time, but then can uh, do some 
explosive burning uh, and then uh, turn around that contraction and uh, expand quickly and throw out uh, the outer layers. And the star may actually do this uh, repeatedly in different pulses and therefore it's called uh, pulsation of pair instability and it's called pair instability because you make electron positron pairs. Uh, it turns out that continues to operate as long as the mass is above some uh, threshold, the mass of your star or your stellar core. And therefore it gives you uh, sort of puffs up the outer layers. It gives you a sort of upper limit on how massive the object can actually be at the end when it uh, collapses. And so that sets some sort of upper limit on the size of the black hole that you can make from these kind of stars. So even our stars of 130 solar masses, they will still end up making just uh, 50 solar mass black holes. And for anybody interested in gravitational waves, that's actually uh, one of the uh, big questions that people are looking for. Uh, if we, 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 uh, does this have any consequences that there is all of the stars from this entire mass range will end up in some masses uh, below that threshold uh, so there should in principle be a bump of uh, seeing some black holes that have or more black holes and around this mass regime of around uh, 40 to 50 solar masses and you should expect to see none uh, of higher masses we will uh, uh, soon see that stars that are more massive than 140 solar masses actually leave no remnant whatsoever so there's really then a gap in black hole masses that you can uh, reasonably expect to make uh, from massive stars through normal stellar evolution uh, because above some certain threshold, the stars will certainly, towards the end of its evolution, uh, puff off the outer layers if it hadn't lost them earlier uh, due to stellar winds. And so, come, uh, moving on uh, um, is uh, what's called the regular pair instability supernovae. Uh, so, this is very similar to this pulsational pair instability, except uh, that the first pulse already entirely disrupts the star. So, again, you have uh, an environment that is uh, very hot above a billion Kelvin. You start making pairs of electrons and positrons uh, that take out internal energy of your gas and that also provides pressure and convert it into rest mass energy of uh, electron positron pairs. And that makes the equation of state softer, more compressible. It starts contracting and uh, then can produce lots of energy from nuclear burning, turning around uh, that ex uh, contraction and uh, making you an explosion. As it turns out, actually a very powerful explosion because you can, can uh, tap the nuclear energy of your star that you release within a very short time scale. So normally all of this energy is also released, but it's released on a much longer time scale. So it can be radiated away in form of photons from the surface of the star or in form of neutrinos. Uh, but not in this case, when it's released in an explosive way, it's deposited inside uh, the gas uh, to an extent where it leads to rapid expansion. So what, what we see in this diagram, uh, the key uh, quantities uh, to look at is uh, this gray curve, the explosion energy. And so I have here two scales at the bottom is the helium core mass. So the mass of the core of the, the helium core of the star that pop is an approximate initial mass of the star. So we're talking here from stars with initial masses of the order of 140 to 260 solar masses. And so the gray curve is the interesting one. This is the explosion energy in uh, beta. So uh, one uh, beta is uh, the typical energy of a uh, uh, core collapse supernova, so 10 to 51 Earth. So uh, these stars, when they explode, they start off already at one, two, three uh, times 10 to 53 ergs, uh, 10 to 51 ergs. So they make they start of explosion that have already three times the uh, explosion energy of a normal core collapse supernovae. I mean, they're, they're big stars, and but the nuclear energy release is still a powerful source uh, for them if you can release it all at once. Uh, and then at the high mass end, it really, uh, the explosion energy can be as high as almost 100 times the explosion energy of a normal uh, supernova. And 
uh, you remember we discussed briefly type 1a supernovae exploding white dwarfs. So they would also have an explosion energy of about one beta. And additionally, they produce about um, a half a solar mass of this radioactive isotope nickel 56. That is very important because it powers the light curve, its decay, it deposits energy in the exploding uh, star and heats it and uh, makes it uh, shine for a long time. And these objects at the end, uh, they will not just make one uh, beta of explosion energy, but they will make uh, 100 beta. And they will also here, this is now on the, on the uh, right, uh, left hand side scale, uh, is the yield in solar masses of stuff that comes out. There's, of course, a lot of oxygen, carbon, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but interesting is here the dash curve is the nickel, 50, is the nickel 56, and they make of the order of 50 to 60 solar masses of uh, nickel 56. So again, uh, and so that's about 100 times the nickel 56 that would be made by a type 1a supernovae. So these normal exploding white dwarfs. So if you have about 100 times the amount of nickel 56 being made and 100 times the explosion energy. So it's basically this object, the most massive of these objects when they explode, they are more or less um, equivalent to 100 type 1a supernova going off all at once in one spot. So a very uh, spectacular explosion, I should say. Uh, unfortunately, they're not uh, also 100 times as bright. There is the problem is that there is uh, 100 times as much mass as well, uh, because you have, well, you don't have 1.4 solar masses for type 1a uh, supernova, but you have 140 solar masses of your helium core uh, exploding, or maybe even 260 for the total stuff. And so this lots of mass also traps the radiation uh, more efficiently. So you don't get out something that's 100 times as bright because much of the radiation is trapped for a long time and just goes into expansion energy of your uh, supernovae. But uh, that said, uh, if there's some material surrounding it, for example, if it goes off in some dense cloud, they don't live very long, uh, then they, there could be interaction with the surrounding material and then some of its energy could again be thermalized and you might get again something out uh, that is bright, similar to this uh, superluminous supernovae uh, we discussed. Um, it turns out, uh, among all the supernova types that we know and we can easily simulate and understand in our computers, uh, these uh, pair and stability supernovae are the most easy to simulate. They are kind of straightforward. There seem to be basically no pitfalls. We know exactly when you make these stars that they will explode and we can predict this fairly uh, reliably. Uh, but observationally, we have never actually observed uh, or with, evid, uh, with confidence any of these objects. So there's no observation uh, to uh, the present day where all the experts agree that this is unambiguously a parent stability supernovae that we have seen exploding. There's always been other potential explanations for those. Um, for example, interaction with uh, inter, uh, uh, materials surrounding a normal supernovae can give you also something very bright. You don't need necessarily uh, this kind of object uh, that has basically 100 type 1a supernovae going off. Okay, so uh, what else is there? Maybe uh, in conclusion, three more items to show. Um, one is uh, about uh, binaries and rotation or binaries, the other is rotation. Um, when we look at massive stars, uh, we can uh, draw a diagram uh, uh, how, uh, what is the probability density uh, for finding stars at a certain separation from each other in a binary system. And uh, they, uh, because the stars will expand, they will become red shines. Uh, they can interact uh, with each other and uh, exchange mass, and that will uh, affect their evolution uh, significantly. So this is something that will then look very different from the stars that we have discussed in this lecture, which are mostly uh, single stars. So there's many of them, they uh, might actually merge. So this could even happen to our uh, star A1 uh, that we discussed uh, as a potential 200 solar mass star. Maybe it was initially two 100 solar mass stars that have merged or there are two 100 solar mass stars that are still merging. 
Um, or another possibility is if they're somewhat further apart, uh, one star could live shorter, uh, dark material on the companion star uh, and uh, spin it up. Uh, and then maybe eventually they evolve inside a common envelope of material surrounding them both. Uh, or in other cases, when the distance initially is maybe somewhat more, uh, you, you might still uh, have some envelope uh, being stripped off uh, the companion star. Um, so all of this depends on what is the mass ratio of the stars and what uh, is the initial separation of these stars. And that this gives you for different masses, uh, possible outcomes of freeze or spin map, envelope stripping, or uh, whether they, you expect uh, mergers. Uh, but only maybe 30% uh, of these stars, they're still sitting in, in binary systems, uh, but they will have very little interaction. So they effectively uh, behave as single stars just because they are too far apart to effectively uh, interact. But a, a significant fraction of the stars are not only in uh, binaries, but also binaries that significantly affect uh, their evolution. The other part is uh, the effect of rotation. Uh, this is a slide by Sun Chul Yun. Uh, this is now shown for a very special uh, kind of stars. Uh, again, going back to stars of very low metallicity. Uh, so uh, po uh, called population three stars, so stars that have formed as the first generation of stars after the Big Bang. And their special property uh, is that they have uh, no metal. So they would, you would expect to have very few winds blowing material off uh, their surfaces. And this shows these different uh, remnant types that we have discussed. Like I said, at the low end, we make our core collapse supernovae here for this type uh, two uh, P supernovae. Uh, then we have made some regime uh, where you might make uh, preferentially black holes. Um, and again, uh, there's a dividing line drawn, but we of course already re recall that uh, this uh, dividing line is uh, indicative. There will be, it's not a really a line. There will be some stars here that only make black holes and some stars on that side they may uh, not yet make. Um, then there's here uh, the strip. So let's uh, first look down here at the uh, low rotation part uh, where you make a pulsational pair instability, you make a regular pair uh, instability. Uh, what I have not discussed yet is that stars that are even more massive uh, than the, the 140 solar mass initially, uh, you uh, again expect to make uh, black holes from uh, direct collapse. So in that case, this mechanism of the pair instability turns out it becomes so hot in the center that you disintegrate all of the material that you've made by burning. And then it costs you a lot of energy and uh, the star, instead of exploding, suddenly decides to collapse the black hole. It's a very sharp transition. Um, but if you have additionally rotation, uh, that will change the masses where things happen. Basically rotation leads to more mixing. So you can get a really larger course or uh, at a lower mass and uh, so lower mass stars that rotate rapidly may effectively behave uh, already uh, like uh, more massive stars that have larger cores that, in which hydrogen was depleted. So a big effect there is that uh, you deplete hydrogen in the main sequence evolution of the star over a larger range of the star because you have some additional mixing beyond uh, the, the boundary of your uh, hydro, of the convection zone that you have, say, during hydrogen burning. So you have effectively a larger uh, burning uh, reach uh, or a region coupling to the, to the burning, a larger chemi uh, chemically mixed uh, region. And then uh, above here, there is uh, a very high rotation rate. Uh, you, uh, the star can be spinning so rapidly that it's not just a little bit more mixing, but actually the entire star may behave, may uh, evolve chemical homogeneous. So the entire star is uh, well mixed throughout, also, or at least during hydrogen burning, maybe some parts of helium burning. And that can give you uh, different uh, uh, outcomes, uh, especially it means that this, if the star is chemical homogeneous evolu evolving uh, during the main sequence, it means that the hydrogen is depleted, not just in some inferior core, but 
throughout the entire star. So you end up directly converting your uh, hydrogen star into a helium star by the end of core hydrogen burning. Uh, and you uh, might make uh, yeah, this regime, when this happens, you have pulsational pair instability and pair instability at some offset uh, lower regions. And then there's also some uh, part here where you may, if you collapse to a black hole, uh, you might make a gamma ray burst. So these are as, uh, similar to the models that I mentioned as a collapser, the collapser model for making uh, exploding stars. You have enough rotation uh, that the material that falls in towards the black hole uh, will go into an accretion disk and that accretion disk may emit a jet uh, in uh, axial direction or drive a jet in axial uh, direction. And you can get uh, what some people at the time called also hypernovae or uh, supernovae uh, or at least have been associated with supernova of type uh, 1bc. Uh, for those of you not familiar with that, that's a supernovae that, that are not type 1a supernovae, but are still supernovae having no hydrogen in their spectrum. Uh, okay, so stellar evolution has uh, still lots more things going on than the simple picture we looked at. Uh, but finally, as a summary slide, I want to look at how uh, da, do, uh, uh, does this picture look like if we change uh, the initial composition of the star. So we, uh, we shunt a little bit around between uh, the evolution of stars that have about solar composition that would be up here on the y axis or stars that are in the early universe that have no metals and no winds just because that makes some of the calculations easier because the winds we don't know uh, that well and so there's uh, some speculation or uh, some variation in, in outcomes of cell evolution for the more massive stars for different research groups because they may assume different make different assumptions about how mass loss is affecting uh, more metal rich stars. So the overall picture is basically uh, what we already discussed at low masses, we make probably uh, near magnesium oxygen uh, cores um, or white dwarfs. Uh, and then uh, there may be a regime where uh, you have, uh, yeah, I mentioned one of the slides, electron capture super, so a narrow regime, you, you can make some very uh, peculiar kind of supernovae before we come to our regular iron core collapse supernovae that we mostly discussed that make neutron stars and then somewhere at some uh, mass around 20, 25 solar masses, there is uh, a transition where you mostly start uh, making black holes. But then there's a very special line up here. This is when the winds uh, from uh, at the surface are strong enough to blow off the entire hydrogen uh, from the surface and what that affects is that once you have removed the hydrogen, you have these different kind of winds, uh, these, these uh, Wolf-Wright star winds that are uh, much more effective and you start losing a lot of mass and that may actually limit uh, that you uh, might no longer make any black holes at all at, for the most metal rich stars uh, in galaxies. And then you have here some band uh, either at a low mass or at uh, not uh, too high metallicity uh, where you making black holes by fallback. So you have removed up here some modest amount of mass uh, in part by world five winds. Um, and then if you go down to uh, even uh, at low metallicities and higher masses, you make uh, direct black holes. So we haven't discussed that here for our solar case, but the idea is if your um, mass is large enough Maybe uh, you don't just make a black hole by fallback, but you make it more or less uh, directly. It may not be a uh, directly collapsing black hole. You may have for a brief time a neutron star before that accretes too much mass uh, to go into a black hole. Um, and maybe for some of the more extreme cases, uh, that neutron star in emitted phase could be uh, rather short. Uh, then uh, we have here our domain we think we have pulsational pair instability uh, and uh, they will puff off the outer layers but in the end you still are left over with something that's 40 50 solar masses that uh, most likely will collapse uh, to a black hole and uh, these objects this is why I have the green line has makes it its detour uh, because 
uh, these pulses would definitely check the hydrogen envelope before the star dies. So at the time the star finally ex uh, uh, collapses to a black hole, the hydrogen envelope would have been thrown out by these pulses from pulsation of air instability. And uh, then if you go here in this higher uh, regime, we have these regular pair instability that uh, explode. Remember, you make up to 100 times the explosion energy of a 5.8 a supernovae. And uh, these, these entirely disrupt the stars, so and there's no remnant left uh, whatsoever. Only if you go uh, to high enough masses, uh, there, uh, again, the star can collapse. And uh, so that's the evolution here towards higher mass. And here, it's just that uh, uh, in, in uh, vertical direction is that because the mass loss is starting to shrink your star before it dies, so there may be some limits uh, to how massive objects you can make at certain uh, masses just because the mass loss becomes increasingly important as you go uh, to higher metallicities. Okay, so I think uh, that is the overview that I wanted uh, to give. Um, and I hope uh, it was uh, educational and you learned some new things and uh, the explanation worked uh, reasonably well for you. And I will be seeing you in the discussion session, some of you and others will uh, meet with uh, Tyron uh, to discuss uh, what questions you might be having. Uh, thank you very much for listening.